excited about, about using field-based eDNA tools for detecting some high priority microbes. Um, I should, uh, this is in uh, collaboration with Nicholas Phelps um, of MACERC. Oops, if I can, oh, let me advance the slide, there we go. Um, so the general problem is that like lots of different types of invasive species or taxa, uh, invasive microbes are among threats to, to Minnesota fish and ecosystems in general. And uh, they can be especially difficult to detect and monitor because they are um, you know, often obviously microscopic um, and require uh, more sensitive or sophisticated methods to detect. Uh, and in some cases, such as disease, uh, where it's the forefront of an outbreak, management action may be needed immediately. And you may not have the time to send off a lot of samples to labs and find out you know, a month or two later what, whether it was there or not. So one solution to trying to detect things like environmental invasive microbes is using environmental DNA. So environmental DNA, if you're not familiar with it, is, is basically isolating DNA or RNA in, in some cases, such as you know, viruses and such, from the environment for species detection and monitoring. Um, and uh, it's been primarily done from water, but it can, it can really be from any sort of environmental substrate, so soil, air, flowers, blood meal, et cetera. There we go. Um, so eDNA can, can, uh, can be a useful tool by say sampling water to, to detect aquatic diseases or other microbes, but typically the, the samples are taken and then sent to a lab where depending on the lab's turnaround, you know, it may take days to weeks to potentially months in processing time. Um, so this is highly sensitive, but may not work if, if, you, if the uh, managers need to know the answer right away. So, you know, if, if inspections for invasive species or if there's a disease outbreak or such um, or other sort of short-term events. So if we're going to be able to be able to effectively apply environmental DNA to these sorts of problems, we need to bring it out into the field away from the lab. And it also requires easy to use protocols and, and relatively straightforward equipment um, because Obviously, it's not going to be geneticists on call running out to the field each time. It will be the you know the field workers, the managers, such that will have to implement these, and and they are typically not geneticists. So one of the approaches using genetic tools that um, has has shown a lot of promise and that our lab has used thus far is getting away from PCR, which is the typical way that we um, uh, amplify DNA in the lab but it requires cycling temperatures in, in more equipment and using uh, uh, isothermal approach. And that just means being able to amplify DNA or RNA using a single temperature. And so, you know, at its simplest, you would just need like a heat block. LAMP is, is one of those methods. I'm not gonna go into how LAMP works um, on this call, although this diagram uh, kind of shows that it you basically amplify the, the DNA fragments by forming these loop structures that are kind of the template for further replication. I can certainly talk more about in the questions if there are, um, but the important thing is one, that it simplifies equipment and two, that it has a, a history of being able to be used for uh, field-based genetic testing. So for instance, Ebola virus was, was one that LAMP was uh, developed for and certainly with like COVID-19 screening, LAMP has been used in that as well. So we can take it from the medical field and apply it to the natural resource sciences. So how do you make this so it goes into the field? Well, you need a few things. You need an isothermal device, um, which like I said, could be as simple as a heat block, or we also use a fluorometer that in addition to keeping a constant temperature, lets us see if, um, if we are getting amplification. You need a fast and simple DNA extraction release method. So such as this cartridge syringe kit that takes about five to 10 minutes to go from filter to DNA extract. And you need stable and portable reagents. So most um, master mixes for, the, for even these lamp reactions require cold storage. However, you can lyophilize them or basically freeze dry them such as you see in these tubes and they should be stable at, at room temperature and be able to be taken in the field. So you can have your filter your water, run it through this quick extraction kit, put your sample into these tubes and run it on this, this device. 
so that's the approach that, that we wanted to take for three high priority microbes in Minnesota. So these are viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus or VHSV, um, a, a fish disease of really extreme concern, not currently known for Minnesota, fortunately, but it's in the Great Lakes and likely on the doorstep. And it's one that we wanna be vigilant for. Um, there's also largemouth bass virus. Uh, this is uh, LNBV, an emerging virus in Minnesota. It, there's been outbreaks at a few lakes in Minnesota. And one of the things that's concerning is that these outbreaks have occurred in lakes that are colder temperatures than would be expected for, um, for the ideal range for the virus. So another one of concern. And then finally, um, outside of a disease, we have uh, um, a diatom, Didiospinia geminata, AKA rock snot, uh, you may know it better by. Um, and it appears to be increasing um, along uh, river tributaries going into Lake Superior uh, along the, the North Shore. Um, and so is a, a concern there to, to track where, how that is spreading. We're working with multiple partners uh, that will ultimately be the, uh, be the people that will apply these, these uh, portable eDNA tests. So these include Minnesota DNR, uh, primarily for the two viral um, targets, uh, or yeah, two viral targets, Voyagers National Park, uh, primarily for VHSV, and Grand Portage, Grand Portage National Monument and the Grand Portage Band of the Minnesota Chippewa for Didymo primarily. And so our objectives, we have two primary objectives. So first is to develop and validate these, these portable lyophilized lamp assays for each target. And uh, in the case of VHSV and LMBV, uh, both of those already have published existing lamp assays, but they have never been validated for portable point of use approaches. So they've never been lyophilized, for instance. So we'll be taking those, those existing assays as a starting point and testing how well they work for lyophilization and portability. If they don't work well, we will design um, new ones for, from scratch. And there needs to be a, a lamp assay developed for Didymo, so we will develop those assays and, and validate them to, to determine their sensitivity and that they work. Once we've done the lab validation, we're going to evaluate these tests in field conditions um, alongside partners, as well as providing training to partners in, in handoff of this technology so that they can apply it on their own and do their own testing without us needing to be there. Um, for VHSV, this will be experimental testing in, in the lab at University of Minnesota, because again, fortunately, there's not yet known sites in Minnesota. Um, obviously, if there are any outbreaks that occur during the course of this project, we would sample there. Um, for LNBV and Didymo, we will test at known sites within Minnesota to confirm efficacy. That can we detect the targets when we know that they are there. And uh, after this field testing, we'll be doing training workshops on the protocols for each partner. And again, such that they are, they are confident with being able to use these new tests in their own natural resource monitoring. And uh, that's all I have. Uh, I, I assume, I think we're doing questions at the end, uh, but whenever we do questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Yeah, we can do questions now. People can ask their questions at any point during the, um, the presentation. I can move on to the next one um, as well. And if we have any more, we'll pull, we'll pull Steve back. Steve, thank you so much for sharing your new project with us and really looking forward to seeing how that, how that works out. Um, and I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Up next, we have a video from uh, a new researcher, Ingrid Schneider, uh, will be presenting on her new project. Greetings, I'm Ingrid Schneider, a professor in the Department of Forest Resources at the University of Minnesota. I'm speaking with you today about a recently funded project titled Beyond the Sign, Influencing Recreational Voters Required Behaviors. I'm grateful to my project partner, Megan Weber, also from the University of Minnesota with Extension and the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center. Um, and I'm grateful to that center for funding. So as you may know, to protect Minnesota waterways from aquatic invasive species, Minnesota statute requires boaters and anglers to clean all visible plants and materials from their watercraft, trailers, and water-related equipment, and drain water-related equipment and build live well and bait well by removing drain plugs and keeping them out while transporting watercraft. However, recreational boaters seem to comply with some but not all of these behaviors. 
Therefore, Minnesota waterways remain at high risk from aquatic invasive species, despite well-intended and widespread efforts to influence preventative behaviors, particularly among those who use a boat to fish. Now, communication research reveals that the more engaging and interactive information is, the more likely it is to influence and potentially change behavioral intentions because the person receiving the message can elaborate on the information provided. Thus, the purpose of this project was to test engaging, interactive educational message mediums related to aquatic invasive species preventative behaviors. Our goal is to increase intentions to perform the preventative behaviors among anglers who use boats to fish. And if successful, this will advance effective uh, aquatic invasive species prevention. So to do this, we are going to systematically observe anglers who use boats to fish and compare their behaviors with required preventative behaviors to reduce aquatic invasive species spread. Then based on what we see, uh, we're going to further explore behaviors with anglers through focus groups. And then we'll use this information to develop messaging about the behaviors. And our messaging will be in two formats, a photo and text maybe you typically see, by nature, these are static and typically, typically elicit lower responses than dynamic messages. And then an augmented reality message. And in our case, the reality will be augmented as users point the camera and a mobile device will provide at an item with a QR-like code. And then once connected, the users will interact with the virtual images in real world context through inputs using audio, video, and other graphics. These messages will be tested through an experiment. Specifically, uh, samples of these anglers who use a boat to fish will randomly be assigned to a control group, a photo group, or an augmented reality group. They'll get a message in one format or another and will compare their intentions to perform preventative behaviors. We anticipate that those getting the more engaging AR message will have greater intentions to perform the preventative behaviors. Uh, this work will add to the very limited data about the effectiveness of these technologies to influence behaviors and reduce aquatic invasive species spread. We'll use the best practices related to these messages and the messages themselves with educational informational networks. And I'll share those. If you have questions, comments, or, or ideas, please do let us know. We're very grateful to have this project funded and thank the Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center and the Environmental Trust uh, for funding. Thank you. All right, that was Ingrid uh, with our with her new project. We also have Megan Weber here with us today who can answer any questions that you might have um, about this new project. There are no questions so far. There is one for Steve. Steve, I'd like to pull you up uh, as well, if you wouldn't mind. Is Didymo in fact native to Minnesota? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. And um, as I understand it, there's, so well, to, to, to answer it, there's probably there are some Didymo strains that are native to Minnesota. However, there's ongoing work Relate and I didn't I didn't mention looking at like different the different genetics of Didymo in in the assay design, but that will be part of it. Um, is that there's are there's ongoing work that suggests that while there may be some native genotypes, there's also invasive genotypes that that may be the ones that are spreading more rapidly and causing issues. Uh, again, again, this is this is ongoing ongoing research, um, and there may be others on the call that that could speak more more directly to to the ins and outs of that. Um, but the, what we will be, we'll be working with some of the, and coordinating with some of the, the folks who are doing research on the, the genetics of Didymo to, to uh, really try and target um, in our assay design ones that would appear to be the ones that are problematic and not just a, a marker that, you know, would, would get any Didymo. Um, and uh, there's, I think there was a second part of the question about, um, about the, it, the conditions to support Didymo. Um, and so where, what we're gonna be targeting and what the, the surveys have, have, that others have done 
are focused on the, the rivers and streams that are tributaries to the um, North Shore of Lake Superior. And that's where um, in Minnesota, where Didymo seems to be spreading and, and seems to be the problem in some of those. And so we'll be, in addition to validating on ones with known um, Didymo uh, 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 outbreak, so to speak, we'll also be um, be testing some of the other ones to see if we pick up unknown populations. But it's more, it's a it's a river and stream issue um, more so than lakes. So hopefully that answered that question. Please feel free to follow up if um, if you have yeah follow ups or, or clar more clarification. Thanks so much, Steve. Megan, we have a couple questions for you. Um, will you also be testing the dispose me message, which is required action by anglers? Yeah, um, so that's a really good question. Um, we so the way that we'll ultimately be like figure out which actions we're focusing on comes after an observational period. So after a period of observing boaters as they're coming out of the water and seeing what actions they're taking or maybe not taking, that's helping us kind of identify where the biggest gaps are. Um, we did kind of early on when thinking about this project talk about bait disposal specifically as well um, and, and ended up kind of landing where we did. There are some challenges to observation of bait disposal um, because it could happen at the landing or they could take it home and dispose of it in the trash at home, I suppose, too. So there's ways that they could dispose of it that we wouldn't see so readily versus many of the other actions that are required to happen like before getting onto a public roadway. Um, <clears throat> so uh, likely I think it'll end up being some of those actions that are required before getting onto a public roadway. Um, but I think, you know, one of the, the, the bait question is one that we've identified as a, like, this could also be, you know, like a next step of research for this. Yeah, we have a few more questions for you. How does get one get from expressed intention to addressing actual behavior change? This might be uh, a question for a social scientist, but Meg. Yeah, I know. This is the question for Ingrid, who's not who's not who is not able to be here right now. Um, so yeah, we, we this is another one that we kind of bounced on versus like intentions versus um, the the actual actions. And I I might be misspeaking, but I think actually Meg McAchran at Maserk might have some data on this as well. Um, I'm not the one with it though. I think this is a like an Ingrid question. Like maybe Meg has some some insight there too. All right, we've got more one more question I think is for you. Um, has there been any research into the use of social norming as a method of communication to recreational boaters? Yes, there has. Um, this is also an area that that kind of falls in these where Minnesota Department of Natural Resources has been putting some energy. Um, the 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 term for it is community based social marketing, and lots of that is like a social norming thing. Um, so yeah, there's there's certainly research along that. The big thing that we're focusing on um, really is that like how that message is relayed. So like, are you just um, getting message, like, are you reading something and that's it? Or are you interacting with it with this augmented reality? So that's the big question that we're getting at is, is kind of like how, how we give that information to the person and how does that impact their, their intentions? And like, are, so are they, are they, um, maybe taking that in and processing it more by having that interaction with something like an augmented reality versus, just reading like standard text with photos and such. Thank you so much, Megan. Hello and welcome. I'm Ben Meinerich with the Minnesota Zoo and Mazurk, and I'll be reporting on our continuation subproject titled uh, Culturing Microalgae to Support Aquatic Invasive Control Species. The Gold Lab and other initiatives at Mazurk require robust zebra mussel test subjects to conduct experiments on rearing and population control methods. Uh, zebra mussels in the wild have an extraordinary influence on algae in the water column, as each mussel can filter a liter of water per day, which has notable impact on water clarity, resulting in higher lake temperatures, 
as well as diminishing resources for native animals as the suspended food becomes unavailable. Uh, one challenge uh, we've encountered uh, in the lab is keeping muscles in good body condition. We've been meeting with the scientific, uh, the Muscle Control Scientific Council for over the last year uh, with participants from across North and South America. And they've identified providing naturally occurring algae species as a significant area of research needing exploration to provide the necessary nutrition test subjects need that they're currently not getting, uh, but demonstrate consuming in the wild. Experiments conducted by, at Mazurk by Mike McCartney last year reinforced findings in the literature that when compared to feeding prepared diets that can be purchased and stored in the refrigerator, feeding live algae has significant benefits. The prepared diet has five different marine algae, including uh, Isochrysis galbana. However, when this marine algae is cultured individually and fed alive, zebra mussels show significantly greater growth. Other species of freshwater algae have comparable nutrition to Isochrysis galbana, which is uh, saltwater algae, and individuals from the Muscle Control Scientific Council identified three freshwater algae that had unique benefits to aid in the culture of zebra mussel larvae. The three highlighted in yellow were chosen for their experiments based on their high protein content, antioxidants, and high lipid content. For our purposes, we chose candidate algae that have good representation of omega-3 fatty acids, in addition to other essential and nutrient-rich amino acids, uh, such as long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, like those with more than 18 carbons, which start at the steric acid and expand to the right on this table. Uh, the three algae highlighted in green have been selected as initial candidates for expanded culture. To date, I've cultured Chlamydomonas and Nanochloropsis algae species in smaller scale systems to feed to resident zebra mussels used for breeding experiments. This project will allow us to expand to higher volumes of algae as we support a higher number of algae, which will diversify nutrition. A new autoclave will reduce staff time required when sterilizing equipment and will increase the culture vessel sizes able to be used. Increased salary support for additional staff will improve efficiencies for culturing this high volume of algae that will be needed to harvest uh, throughout the week. And by the end of this project, we aim to have supported the research of population control and breeding ex experiments by feeding experimental zebra mussels to have better understanding of which algae species are most beneficial to zebra mussels by comparing growth rates of several treatments of algae types and combinations and have protocols and equipment in place to support future zebra mussel research that will better represent algae availability in the lab that zebra mussels experience in the local lakes, which will strengthen experimental accuracy of control methods. Uh, I'd like to give a great thanks to the NRTF and Mazurk uh, for supporting this research. Uh, we hope to be reporting back to you soon by uh, the end of 2023 with um, positive results. Thank you very much.